This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is the beach. It's also the perfect place to enjoy the holidays. Here you can get all the holiday cheer you can handle, plus 60 miles of beaches and endless fun. There are just not that many places where you can celebrate the holidays or ring in the new year with an ocean view. And this time of year in Myrtle Beach is great for horseback riding along the shoreline, fishing from charter boats or in the intracoastal waterways, or golfing at any of the 80-plus award-winning courses. So take a holiday from the average holiday season at the beach. Plan your getaway to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at visitmyrtlebeach.com. Welcome to GabFest Reads for the month of December. I'm John Dickerson, one of the hosts of the Slate Political GabFest, as you know. My guest today is Gotham Makunda, author of Picking Presidents, How to Make the Most Consequential Decision in the World. He is a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership and also the author of Indispensable, When Leaders Really Matter. Welcome to the show. Thank you, John. A pleasure to be here. Um, let's start with Indispensable because we have to tell the backstory of how you yeah. and I know each other. Um, so I am reading Eric Barker's book. And in it, he cites you, mm-hmm. and that he, he cites the study you did on presidents. And I thought, this is something I've been trying to get my hands around for so long. Talk about that book, Indispensable, before yeah. we get to your current book. The backstory for Indispensable is simple. Everybody, I bet you've done this, everyone's, and everyone who's ever had a dorm room debate in college has sort of thought about this question, do individuals matter? Right. right? And this, I mean, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. You can see Thucydides and Plato having implicit discussions about do individuals matter or is it all about systems? Is it all about circumstances? And so I was in grad school and I read the research on, le- on leadership and sort of across this, and I'm in political science, but across fields and economics and psychology, you name it. And they all say leaders don't really matter that much. And I came from the private sector. I didn't really believe that, right? I had too many encounters with leaders who really seemed to make a matter, uh, make a difference. In your own personal experience. In my own personal experience. Yeah, you felt the pull of a person who's leading. I'd worked with team leaders who were disastrous, yeah. and I'd worked with team leaders who were magical. And so I really just kind of dived into this question. And what, what I discovered was that leaders don't matter most of the time, and that most of the time is really important because they're selected. There, but there's no random, pro- there, you know, there's some process, especially if you're talking about a big organization like a General Electric or a CBS or anything like that. There's some process that evaluates all the candidates for leadership. And what I, just, I call it is they, they are filtered. They're evaluated by the process. And if, over time, the process gets to know everything about them. And so the person who's picked isn't the leader. It's the process, right? It's the set of decisions this person will make in the future that the process is saying, this is what we want. But... Let's say that's true, and I think it is true most of the time. Um, Suppose the process doesn't get a chance to evaluate candidates. For some reason, somebody gets the top job without being evaluated, or the evaluation doesn't matter. Say, they inherit it. So in the Mm -hmm. corporate structure, would this be a board says, we're dropping in Joe? That's right. Yeah. uh, Joe doesn't come up through the process or come from an adjacent company. Boom, we're dropping him in. Or, br- or Joanne. Joanne, yeah. <laughs> uh, now it is sometimes. Yeah, we, we're bringing in a total outsider, someone, so maybe someone who's from a different industry, someone who's from a different country, someone who we don't, the boards often think they know a lot about, but whom they actually don't know that much about. They're almost always surprised. And I can tell you some amazing stories of boards who made choices where they went, wait, what? <laughs> we did not expect that. Um, and so those people, because they are not filtered, they have the potential to be very, very different from all the other people who would be in the job. And because they're different, they can make choices that are different. They can do things that no one else would do. So the way I think about it is suppose you brought in a CEO and the f- they, first thing they did was get rid of the board that had brought them in and replace them with a hand-picked ultra-compliant board. And they go to that ultra-compliant board and they say, well, I'm going to get rid of 70% of the products my company makes. And this board says, no, like that, that's crazy, right? You need to stop and think and do a study and maybe about half of that. He says, no, I'm going to do it anyways, does it. Now, usually when I tell the story to students, I'm like, how many of you think this story ends happily? Everybody's like, no, that sounds awful. And one person will stick their hand up and say, I think that's Steve. And it is. What do we know about those unique choices? They're high variance. They either look brilliant or they're disastrous. 
but they're rarely boring. Right. And so Indispensable lays out this argument that the leaders who matter, the individuals who matter, and interestingly, this it applies across fields and across domains. It turns out it, looks, it applies to presidents, it applies to prime ministers of Britain, it applies to generals, it applies to CEOs, it even, and I love this, applies to scientists. So if you think about it in the context of the sciences, right, the biggest discoveries are the ones that tell us that the things that we thought were true aren't. But if you're going through peer review and you have to ask all these senior scientists, well, should I do this experiment to prove that this thing that all of you believe is not true, their answer will be no, because it is true. So this is just a waste of money. Yes. And most of the time they're right. Yes. This isn't about bad intentions. Most of the time what they think is true is actually true. That's why they're senior scientists. So these these unfiltered lead, are the ones the, across fields are the ones who do big things. Yeah. But sometimes they're big good things, and more often they're big bad things. Right. And so that first book was really thinking about that. And then, so at the end of the book, my, my editor sort of he calls me and he says, so, you know, we like to have practical applications for our books. And this person will be good or awful, but we don't know which. Yeah. is not the most practical thing you could tell right. a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. right. We want news you can use. Yeah. So, so, so is there anything you can tell us? And so my, my honest first answer, and it's still true, is the biggest, the biggest indicator is luck, right? So Hyman Rickover, right, the father of the nuclear Navy, wonderfully said, you know, luck is better than skill. I can't use you if you're not lucky. Right. I'm sure, so one of the things I often ask um, entrepreneurs when I'm thinking, of, you know, do, are they going to, is I ask them, how lucky were they? Yeah. And the ones I like are the ones who say very. Now, um, what's their definition of luck? Because obviously mm -hmm. chance favors the well-prepared, right? Yeah. So luck comes to those who, who do the work. Yeah. Absolutely, right? So chance favors the prepared mind, right? Louis Pasteur, Branch, right? There's all sorts of... So absolutely true. But um, so I ended up as a professor at Harvard Business School because a friend of mine was working for a company founded by Clay Christensen. Mm. And I wrote, uh, I wrote a paper that, a uh, paper applying Clay Christensen's ideas to militaries. And he said, you should go meet Clay. And I did. And at the end of that meeting, Clay, all six feet eight of him, looks down at me and says, you know, I think you should come teach at Harvard Business School. If not for that conversation, I, I would never have been a professor of the business school because it wouldn't even have occurred to me to apply. Right, right? right, Political scientists don't teach at business schools. And we should remind people that right. Clayton Christensen was a professor uh, at Harvard's business yeah. school, among other things, was the author of the uh, disruption theory. He created the theory created? of disruptive innovation. Yeah, he right. wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. He's a great, great man. Uh, and so, I mean, I presumably was qualified to be a professor at Harvard Business School. But if my friend hadn't been working for this company, my whole life would be completely, I don't know if it would be better or worse, yeah. but it would be completely different. Sure. That's yeah. luck. Yes. Right? That's not skill. Yeah. So luck matters a lot. But what I said in the first book, and I, I, you know this, I really need to emphasize this because the first book was published in 2012. Yes. So right. there was nothing about current politics that I was thinking about when I, when I wrote it. Um, I said, that, well, there, what you need to worry about is these unfiltered leaders who have what I call false signals, things that make them look more capable than they actually are. And the four false signals that I identified are personality and psychological disorders, where the examples I used were narcissism and psychopathy, mm -hmm. out of the mainstream and highly simplistic ideologies, and a risk-prone or incompetent managerial approach, and unearned advantages like inherited wealth. Yeah. So that happened. <laughs> um, and then 2016 rolled around. And just, just because, yeah. to reemphasize the fact that you wrote that long before... Um, Donald Trump ever came yeah. on the scene. How did you come to those four dangerous um, so, parts of a bad leader? So what I was thinking about was what would make you pick someone who was a failure? Yeah. And what each of those have in common. So narcissism. Narcissism is, if, if you've ever, you know, ever met narcissists, it's not ambiguous, right? They kind of jump out at you. But the funny thing about narcissists is they're incredibly impressive when you first meet them. If you put a bunch of people in a room, we've done this experiment, and you ask them to vote on who should be the leader, they'll vote for the narcissist. But narcissists are awful leaders. Yeah. So right, the, the unfiltered people are people we have not gotten a chance to fully evaluate. When you first meet someone, you go, wow, they must be great. 
And after a year, you go, oh, God, what was I thinking? Right. And but, you impute on them all these skills because right. they're so charming. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, they're charming. They must be great at this, this, and this. Yeah. But you have no actual empirical reason to say that. Not at all. And they believe they are, so there must <laughs> be some foundation for <laughs> right. that, right? And it's incredible how powerful that effect is. So the same thing with a, a powerful family, right? So if we think about this, so you've probably asked people this. What did you learn from your experience? Right. So learning from experience is important. I, I strongly urge people to learn from their experiences. Right. But what that's that's experience is a developmental process. But experience is also a revelatory process. Right. Because as you get the experience, the rest of us are watching you mm -hmm. and we're evaluating what you do. Yeah. And we're evaluating. Are you actually capable? What are you, you know? Are you what, what are you what can you do under pressure? But if your family is so wealthy and powerful that it can pull strings to make sure that you get promoted, whether or not you did a good job, then we are short-circuiting the revelatory component of experience. Yes. We can't learn about you what we should have. Right. And you're not learning from the revelatory experience. Yeah, you may not be. That's failed, right. yeah. uh, you know, or, or had it been hard and overcoming obstacles yeah. and the rest. Yeah, you may be learning about, you may also be learning much less from it. But, you know, we just don't know. So yes. I was looking for that set of traits that tell, you know, risk-taking management. If, if I'm a gambler and I get lucky four or five times in a row, I may look like a genius, but I'm just a gambler. Right. So that was my first book, and then events occurred, and, and, I, was sort of, and I sort of said, okay, I had two missions for the second book. One was, although I didn't know you were writing your book at the time, uh, it turned out that we were writing, I think, really a matched set, which, which you know, was wonderful when yeah. I read your book. I went, oh, this is great. You were asking, is this job doable? And I was asking, how do we pick someone who can do it? Right. If it is possible to do, we want the best person. And so that, that's the first half of, of what the, the book's second intellectual agenda was this. I wanted to refine that, either good or awful, but I don't know which. Right. Right. And so it says the presidency is the world's best laboratory for studying leadership. Because we know more about presidents yes. than we know any other, right? There, we know about any other leadership office. There are more books about Abraham Lincoln than any other person who's ever lived except Jesus, mm -hmm. right? We just study the presidency at a level that is hard to believe. And, and, you know, despite the best efforts of the last few administrations, the American government is just more transparent than anybody else's. So we right. know more. I mean, you can go to your college library and get the, like, foreign relations of the United States documents on the shelf, right. which no one else can give you. So let me refine that, that yeah. idea a little bit in two ways. One, because there are so many books about Lincoln and the rest, a lot of us, including myself, make them seem 20 feet tall and, you know, that, that a lot of it's hagiography, yeah. which cloudies the message. So how do you deal with the cloudiness of hagiography? And also, how much more idiosyncratic is the leadership job of, of being a president from all the other kinds yeah. of leadership you need to do? The hagiography question is a big problem. Um, and so I parse, parse it in a few ways. One is, I guess, I sort of read these things and go, do we really believe this? But the better way is... I want to know what other people would have done. Yeah. So, histor you know, historian, social scientists, we call this the counterfactual. Sure. So the easy example is like December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, we declare war. Any president would have done it, right? The, the counterfactual, there is no person who could have been president of the United States who would not have declared war on Germany, right. on Japan, right? It's just inconceivable. Right. But there are lots of other decisions that presidents have made where the counterfactual runs the other way. Just recently, you know, staking in the re regime of war and peace. If Al Gore had been president instead of George W. Bush, would we have invaded Iraq? Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you with certainty, but Al Gore was probably the single politician, the most single, most prominent politician to oppose the invasion of Iraq mm -hmm. before the war, right? At a time when that did not make you popular. Right. right. So given the political incentives were all support the war at the time, and he opposed it. This suggests to me pretty strongly that if he'd been president, we would not have invaded. Mm -hmm. So there the counterfactual is really strong. And I think we can parse the, you know, the tendency to sort of say, well, they were in, they were in power. They must have done the right thing by looking, looking at other people who were almost in power mm -hmm. and seeing what they wanted to do. For the idiosyncrasy, there is nothing like the presidency. As you, know, like, as you may know that better than anyone who hasn't been president, John, <laughs> having studied, you know, been so close to so many. But I would never say that being president is like other leaders, right? And too many... Too many people make the opposite, uh, sure. right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. This CEO would make a good president. The skill sets have no, you know, not no overlap, but marginal overlap. Right. 
But there are characteristics that make you a good leader that may port from one to the other. Yeah. So the brilliant psychologist, uh, Dean Simonton, out in Cal, you know, he's out in California, mm -hmm. who is the, you know, he, he studies performance and greatness. And I mean, if you ever look at his CV, which goes on for, you know, it's the length of a book, you're like, well, he knows greatness from the inside. <laughs> <not just> the <laughs> inside. And, and, and what he finds, for example, is that this across fields, not just in the presidency, but in different leadership positions, even in different positions outside of leadership, like in art, um, what he calls intellectual brilliance is a really strong predictor of performance. And intellectual brilliance, he says, it's not IQ. It's related to IQ, but it's, it's a sort of horsepower, but it's also how curious are you? How open-minded? How, how engaged in new experiences? How broad are your breadth of interest? Things like that. Uh, and so, you know, when we think about it that way, so... Abraham Lincoln had only three months of formal education, but he's also the only president ever to have a patent, which sounds like a piece of random trivia, but in this context actually does tell you something about, oh, maybe that explains why, maybe part of the reason why he was so gifted. Theodore Roosevelt right, was 42 when he became president of the United States. I suspect he will have that record as the youngest president until the end of time, right? Yeah. When he was 42, he had written 12 books. Um, two to three, two or three of those books are still considered all-time classics. Yeah. That's intellectual brilliance at a yeah. remarkable level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that quality seems to port pretty well. I think right. there are others. And so what I think of as the presidency is then the second, second mission for the book, right, is let's refine this good or bad mm -hmm. so that you can use this for places that are not the presidency. Yeah. And if you are a board of directors or a nonprofit and you want to pick a new leader, either you pick a filtered leader who you are very confident in or you pick an unfiltered leader who you have, you've got a good shot. Yeah. And if you know which of the two you're picking, you then know which are the component attributes they need to have yeah. to break out of the limitations of each. Very much so, because they're not the same. So there have yeah. been many previous attempts to, to map sort of pre-presidential biography to presidential performance. Right. To the extent that they found anything, the relationships were pretty weak. Yes. And... What I realize is because social science is all of these attempts were sort of looking at all the presidents the same and grouping them together and saying, on average, this is this or this. Social scientists are trained to look at difference in average. Um, what I was interested in was difference in variance, right? So what I really, what I, I mean, the, the difference between the 20th best president and the 25th best president is probably kind of noise. Yeah. The difference between first and 40th is really big. Yeah. And so I really cared about that. I wanted to know the people at the extremes and understand what was driving that. Because if you have a, one, a person who's ranked one or the worst, it can be get pretty bad. It, as bad as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and so what I discovered in both the first and the second books, right, is there are characteristics that lead to high variance. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying unfiltered and you're looking at averages, you don't see anything because the two averages cancel out. But if you look at spread, you see everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so in this case, what, I'm, what I was saying is look, look at, you know, split them out and you look at the unfiltered and the filtered presidents differently. Filtered presidents are the ones we know everything about. George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, the ultimate example is Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. 44 years in the Senate and the vice presidency before he became president. And when you say we, kn we know the most about them, we know the most about them in the kind of governing context. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And even more than we know about them, we know what other political elites know about them. Right. right? That they are making a judgment of this person based on, I mean, most of us haven't been married for 44 years, right? So they know these people at sometimes better than they know their spouses, or at least for longer than they've known their spouses. And they're able to make a really deep judgment of someone like that. Flip side is, you know, Donald Trump for sure, but also Barack Obama or, um, or Abraham Lincoln or Woodrow yeah. Wilson or Theodore Roosevelt. Lots of people who were not these fully evaluated people who could do things that, you wouldn't, that would surprise you. And so those people we need to judge very differently because we can't rely on, um, well, everybody in this person's party thinks they would be a good president. Yeah. Everybody in this person's party doesn't know them or they may think they'd be a really bad president. So we need to make, the, we need to make a much more complex judgment. Yeah. Uh, and part of it is this intellectual brilliance question. And I do think that is incredibly important. And the reason it's important is because the president, he, he or she is president for a long time. So what they face two years into the, White, into the White, in the White House or four years later, it's not what we elected them for. It's not what we expected them to do. Who, you know, did George, George W. Bush did not get elected based on what he was going to do against terrorism. Sure. That wasn't even on the agenda. 
What intellectual brilliance does is give you a broad suite of capabilities. So they are people who are very, very likely to be able to handle a new problem, as well as the problems that we thought that they were, they were facing. We're going to take a quick break here, but we'll be back with more from Gotham Makunda right after we pay some bills. Every leader wants their employees to live and work happily ever after. Thankfully, you don't need a magic wand or a fairy godmother to make that dream come true. HR, payroll, and workforce management solutions from UKG give you the tools you need to support and celebrate all your people. Make your fairy tale workplace a reality with UKG. UKG, our purpose is people. This episode is brought to you by 1923 on Paramount+. Plus. In Taylor Sheridan's new original series, 1923, the Duttons confront challenges, including the end of the First World War, America's industrialization, and the start of the Great Depression. Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford star in the new original series, 1923, streaming December 18th exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Head to ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Let's burrow in on intellectual Mm -hmm. um, brilliance a little bit. What does it look like when it's at home? Like, what are the component parts of it? And then how is that a part of How would a president manifest those? So component parts are things. So first is, you know, what we call horsepower, right? Um, there's all, there are lots of debates over how valid IQ as a measure is. I'm not a psychometrician. I don't want to dive into them. I observe that in every third grade class, all the kids know who the smartest kid in the class is. So, and they seem to have some consensus on that. So there's something they're measured. There's something that we have an intuitive sense of that we measure and that we can judge from person to person. Um, one of the big traits is cognitive complexity. So do you see the world as a very simple one or as a set of very, a large number of entities that are interrelated? So Simonton, again, did this wonderful research where he looked at generals in land battles before the battle. And he was able to measure their cognitive complexity by the complexity of the orders they would give out before the battle. And he found that cognitive complexity was a stronger predictor of victory than the number of troops. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Because uh, were the orders then themselves complex or was the thinking uh, complex, but the orders were simple because a good leader knows don't give people like a lot of stuff, give them one thing. So the orders were communicated clearly, so clearly that they that they really, you know, they were impossible to misunderstand. Yes. But they were not right. As with you can be clear and complex, right? Mm -hmm. That that they were conveying sophisticated concepts. Um, if you've ever read uh, John Keegan's wonderful book, The Mask of Command, mm-hmm. he talks about the Duke of Wellington and the order. He has one written order that Wellington gave during the Battle of Waterloo where he's literally written it out. Um, and, you know, it's the one we have because he would erase the orders and rewrite them on the same sheet, on the same scrap of the scrap. Uh, and Keegan analyzes this one order. And it's important to note, he wrote this while people were shooting at him. Sure. Right? Yes, like, exactly, like not, yeah. not exactly <laughs> like day at the beach conditions. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm remembering Keegan says, you know, the grammar is perfect. He uses five different tenses, right? It is a set of like nested if thens, if this, then that. But it is absolutely impossible to misunderstand. Yeah. And so that is cognitive complexity. And, you know, and at the same time, you know, Wellington must have had ice water for blood, right? Like, like right. total calm under pressure that really revealed itself in that context. And it turns out that's true in a, lar- that's true in a large number of contexts. Um, creativity, right? So have they written books? Do they read lots of books? Do they speak languages? Do they have lots of hobbies? You see this, this over and over again, these people who kind of spark 
it, it, and it's not that it's narrow. It really is sort of, you know, yeah, he's specialized. That's his, that's his area. But it is this ability to speak in different fields and cross boundaries in a way that is fairly rare. But in leadership positions where quintessentially you are forced to be a generalist simply because if you're not, you cannot succeed because you'll deal with threats from everywhere. It really matters. Yeah. It really matters because... At the end of the day, presidential leadership is about what? So the problem is, the answer to your question is everything. Yeah. I, I was say, the, uh, I, I, I'm not saying this to flatter you. It is true. The best descriptor of that was your book, where you talked about like a day Barack Obama had, where he went from going and making like major national security decisions to consoling people whose family members had died to, you know, just one thing after the other. If you looked at the calendar for the, I mean, like for the average president of the United States, not even, you know, the big days, not 9-11, not, you know, but just the average day. The scope of what this person has to deal with boggles the mind. Yeah. I'm a little more optimistic, maybe, in that I do think that the job is doable. Mm -hmm. I think we should shrink it, not because we can't find people to do it, but because the pool of people who can is so vanishingly small that we're kind of, we're pushing our luck, right. is the way I would put it. Right. How many people in the world can give you sophisticated, well thought through, ideas and thoughts on military policy, economic policy, you know, diplomatic relations, uh, international trade, you know, uh, legal theory, and what's the best way to pardon the Thanksgiving, you know, to pardon the Thanksgiving turkey. Right. That's not an exceptional day. That's not like an exceptional month for the president. That's a Tuesday. And, and as we have this conversation, the presidency yeah. is changing because one of the things that struck me about Joe Biden is here's a guy with all of the the slap and tickle talents of a, yeah. of a senator, and he pretty much can't use them because we are in a place now where if a president is associated with a piece of legislation, the chances it's going to get bipartisan support diminish yeah. because the other side doesn't want to be a part of anything that a president from the other team is for. So the human portion of the job is shifting, but where does the human portion of, of, of this brilliance play in? So I think it's, it's, I still think it's important. Um, and it's important in a few ways. One is some of it is probably happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Joe Biden broke the vertical axis of the graphs in my book because I was I was sort of doing graphs of, you know, how many years and what I call filtering positions, senior political losses do people have? And the record holder before Biden was 24. That was, that's tied between Gerald Ford and James E. Buchanan. And Biden is 44, right? I mean, he, I, literally just off the, you know, not metaphorically off the chart. He was literally off the chart. Right. right. <laughs> and he has gotten more bipartisan bills passed than I think almost anyone expected. Certainly more than oh, I expected. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how that happened, but I'd be pretty surprised if that didn't involve some stuff, you know, behind this exactly the slap and tickle senatorial skills you're talking about. Or you could make the case, and I'm not making this yeah. case because I'm not sure I have the evidence uh, one way or the other. I just am un uninformed. But you can make the case that certainly Truman did this, yeah. which is staying out of conversations is sometimes the most impressive example of emotional intelligence than your ability to woo everybody in the room. Oh, absolutely. I think his will... It is a unique ability in a, a president. No, unique is, is might be overstated, but it's rare to yield focus, yeah. right? Um, yeah, uh, Alice Alice Roosevelt said of her father, uh, <laughs> right, right, uh, <laughs> Theodore, that you know he at every at every wedding he wanted to be the bride, and at every funeral he wanted to be the corpse. Yeah, uh, and I've said you know like I've said that about Bill Clinton. Like it is just part of being the president. Yeah. Biden doesn't seem to be like that yeah. in a way that is different, and I suspect is part of what the, the party elites were looking for when yeah. they picked him as their front runner. I want to make sure that I uh, get to the get to the kind of, um, well, prepare those who are watching and listening um, for the next selection. Yeah. That everybody's got a role to play. Sure. So you say that the seeds of disaster are embedded in the way we pick presidents. What do you mean? So let me, let, let, there are two, t I would say there are two sets of seeds of disaster and they both worry me. One is the way that we, we are so prone to selecting unfiltered presidents. So uniquely among major countries, we pick unfiltered leaders about half the time. Let's put that in context. The, if you look at filtration as sort of years of experience in the upper levels of the government, the least experienced, least filtered British prime minister of the modern era, meaning since 1832, is John Major, who spent 13 years in parliament before he became prime minister. 
I am the only person in history ever to use the phrase, the meteoric rise of John Major, right? <laughs> um, but that puts him in the upper quarter of American presidents. Yeah, in terms of experience in terms of being ex filtered. Yeah. So that that's kind of scary. Someone who literally has the ability to end human civilization. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, even one step down from that controls, not controls, but has enormous influence over, you know, the military and maybe like every single facet of not just American life, but world life. Do you really want to give that to someone who you don't know a lot about and you don't know how good they are? Like, that's pretty scary. Yeah. Um, and that not just can go wrong, it has gone wrong. So Andrew Johnson um, was Abraham Lincoln's successor as president of the United States, only became president because of Lincoln's assassination. No one wanted him to be president. Andrew Johnson set back civil rights in this country by a century, mm. right? The United States, like black Americans had more civil rights in the United States in 1870 than they did in 1950, probably more than 1960. That's kind of hard to imagine, but that was because of Andrew Johnson, mm. because when the war was over and the South had been so thoroughly defeated in the Civil War, they were ready to accept black rights for blacks. They were ready to accept civil rights. And then Johnson essentially said to the South, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you victory and peace even though you lost the war. Right? You're going to win the peace and lose the lost lose the war and win the peace because I want to restore the social structures of the South to what they were before the war. And he was impeached for this too late, belated, you know, eventually. But by the time he was done with that, he had given them hope that they could maintain their old structures and we got, you know, a century of bitter resistance to segre to a bitter resistance to civil rights. That didn't have to happen. It just didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. So one bad president can do that. Yeah. That's, that's you know, the, short of nuclear war, it's kind of hard to scale, to be worse on the scale than that. Okay, but the other seed of disaster, the one that really worries me, is Andrew Johnson's only contender for worst president of yeah. all time, James Buchanan. <laughs> and Buchanan is the most filtered president ever, right? Uh, before, until Biden. 24 years in senior political office before he became president. And then he, he and then he essentially leads the United States in civil war, and so when I when I wrote the book, the second book, I knew my my hardest chapter would be James Buchanan because I didn't know what happened there, right? I mean, everything about my theory says this guy should be pretty good, yeah, and he's the worst, right? You know, not metaphorically, he's literally the worst. So what happened? And what I realized eventually was when Buchanan was selected for the presidency, his um. The Democratic Party had a rule where you had to get two-thirds of the votes in the convention to get the nomination. Two, not half, two-thirds. Mm. What that meant was it was mathematically impossible to get the nomination without the support of the South. So if you were an ambitious Democratic politician, no matter where you were from, and you wanted to be president, you had to adopt positions that may, got you the support of the South. Yeah. Now, over time, what happens? The South's demands keep escalating, right? The, the bar you have to meet to get the support of the South keeps going up and up and up until by the time Buchanan is, is, is running for the nomination, we've gone from, so, you know, when Thomas Jefferson had slaves, he at least acknowledged it was a bad thing. That's, that doesn't forgive him. That doesn't say it's okay. I'm not making excuses for what he did. But he knew he was wrong. Yeah. By the 1850s, the dominant position in the South was what they called the pro-slavery position, where they said slavery was a good thing, the North should be ashamed of itself because it doesn't have slaves, and the full power of the federal government should be deployed to protect and to expand slavery. Obviously a very different set of positions. And so because the South had gained control over the nominating process of the Democratic Party, it would only select nominees who would give it everything it wanted, mm. known, at the, known in the era as doe faces, northern men with southern principles. Buchanan was the ultimate doe face, right? And so these escalating demands meant that more and more and more, the full power of the federal government and everything it could do was devoted to the interests of a single tiny frag, you know, like less than a third of the country. Until the system collapsed mm -hmm. in the Civil War, right. right? Where the South seceded, not because they were getting hurt, but just because they had lost an election. So the scare for me is that you is that I worry that our partisan, our political nomination nominating systems today might be prone to the same sort of interest group capture. So the president gets elected and is cap captured by an interest group that causes that president to 
So, so totally at odds with the, with the majority of the country. Before the, the only way the president can be elected yeah. is by cooperating with that interest group. Yes. Yeah, right? Yes. So, so you're essentially, even before you get to the White House, you're selecting to make sure that you only get those people. And in this case, slavery or the South is the modern day equivalent of that would be the most ideologically uh, extreme members of the party and because those tend or could basically run the nominating process. Right. They already do, but they, imagine they get more extreme and control it even more. That's right. That's that's my great con- the great concern, right, is that you see is that you the people who vote in party primaries are not representative. It's not just that they're not representative of the general public. They're not representative of the average member of sure. their party. party. Yeah. That is never a healthy tendency. So what I have sort of suggested is that we should change the party rules to give them a negative vote which is they cannot pick someone. The, you know, like the 800 or however many superdelegates can't get together and all cast their vote for someone. But they can vote against someone. They can say, my vote is going to subtract one from this person's delegate count. And I think that would be a really good way for them to sort of be able to put, you know, a thumb on the scene saying, you can pick, any, you, sort of, you can have anyone you want, but not this person. Because mm-hmm. I just, like, I can tell you this person will be a disaster. Yeah. So that is, you know, more demo- in, in some ways, I think more democratic than the current system, where they can vote however they want, mm-hmm. but not but enough. But adds a little bit of a filtration a component that is really crucial. But for the questions that you that I'd start with the simple one: filtered or unfiltered, right? If you look at a filtered candidate, we should start off with a pretty high level of confidence, unless you know, unless that filtration is they've been captured and when you, right. know, you have to you have to think about that really hard and that's not an easy one to answer right and one would be a great way to measure that would just be how re- representative are this person's views of those of not the median you know not the median primary voter but the median member of their party right right, right. so you know if you poll republicans on cutting taxes on the wealthy you find out that the average republican voter is actually not very sympathetic to it which is you know, the single fact about American politics that most surprises my friends yes. is that most Republicans don't want to cut taxes on the wealthy. Yeah. But most Republican primary voters and even more important primary donors do. So yeah. you get a disjunction. Right. 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 So I would be really I would I would drill in on the but for filtered leaders. OK, like, you know, unless you with, with that caveat of are they representing an extreme fraction faction of the party, you should feel relatively confident. So what I is this the questions you do ask. You know, how long have you been governor? What did you do when you were governor, right? What did the what did the other people in your state think of you? And what are we testing for there? Because we know they're filtered. Yeah. They've come up through a system. They're yeah. not wit- captured by the extremes. Are we looking for um, risk taking? Because because filtered suggests kind of they don't take risks. They've been able to get along, go along. What are we looking for in terms of attributes from a filtered president? Looking for uh, at, at sort of a, the first is a basic level of capability, right? So because. Someone who perfectly plays it safe is never going to make it to the presidency either because there are lots of people who do want to be in the right? right. What you're looking at is someone who takes measured risks, mm-hmm. who's able to make the distinction between, oh, this is good and this, I'm not going to gamble all the time. Because right. gambling all the time is disastrous and you, you don't want to play that game ever. So you're looking at someone who's able, in the judgment of people who know them best, to demonstrate you know, success not once or twice, but over the span of decades. So in a real sense... I don't know what combination of qualities produced those successes, and I'm not sure I care, right? Because whatever combination of qualities it was, it worked. Mm-hmm. You know, past performance is no guarantee of future results, but it's what we've got. <laughs> and so this, that past performance is encouraging. Yeah. Um, you know, we think of the, the sort of people always say Ronald Reagan. Well, yeah, he was just an actor. Well, yeah, but he was also the two-term governor of the largest state in the union, yeah. right? He almost became pro- the Republican nominee in 1976. Republicans knew a lot about Ronald Reagan. So unfilt- unfiltered yeah. leaders, what that seems like that's a more rigorous yeah. That's test. That's the one that's, you know, the, 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 the stakes are higher and the questions are harder because we know less about these people. Right. The first one is you want to avoid negative signals. You want to avoid false signals. Yeah. Right. So people who have things that make them look better than they really are. We talked about what they were, but that that theory is more developed now. Right. Yeah. So the the starter is the dark triad. So this the set of personality characteristics, narcissism, Machiavellianism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. Right. But, yeah, these are all the what these traits have in common is they give you create a positive first impression and long term negative effects. Mm-hmm. Um, there's psychology papers that actually say this, that the classic figure in, pop, in popular fiction of the Dark Triad is James Bond, mm. right? Great traits for a spy. You meet him, he's really impressive, and he leaves before you get that, right? 
the dark triad is really scary. Um, if you've met, if you've met a real psychopath and you realize who you're dealing with, you will never forget it. Mm. It is terrifying. Um, narcissists, Machiavellians, the same thing. It, it, they're very effective in short terms and disastrous in the long run. And so, and but you as a right, you as a reporter get the chance to actually look at their life because these are traits that show up out in your personal life as well as your professional life right. too, right? Right. Um, if you see someone who tells lies all the time, right, routinely, on a not you know politicians fib, okay, that's that's part of the game, but there are order of magnitude differences between the way a true Machiavellian lies yes. and your, a normal politician lies, yeah. right? If they lie about everything, that's a really bad sign, right? That's the way psychopaths act. That's the way Machiavellians act. Right. Um, and then so so the negative signals you want to avoid those. But the other, the flip side is positive signals. You want to look for things that give you more information about someone's underlying capability than you really know you had, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, having written, you know, writing books is great, but it actually does tell you something about their, are they an artist, right? Do they do things? But the one that I think is, is most easiest to discern and maybe most telling are handicaps. And what I mean by that is characteristics that make it harder to get the job, but not do the job. Okay. Like? Like being black. Yeah. Being a woman being gay, being a religious minority, being short, maybe, right? Being from a poor family. All of those things we know, they make it much harder to get the top job. The, so it, it shows you have grit. It show, does show you have grit, but the other way to think about it is, okay, suppose you were able to win a 100-yard dash while wearing a weighted vest. Yeah. Think how fast you would be when you took the vest off. So any of those characteristics make it much harder for you to become president. Right. But they have no relevance on your ability to be a good president. Thank you so much for being with me. This was a delight. Thank you. This was wonderful, John. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operation of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back in the new year with more episodes of GabFest Reads. Until then, all three of us will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GabFest. <laughs>